I would like to bring Chris Pallister up to present to us on tsunami debris. Um, I want to thank Wendy and Nancy Wallace and all the rest that have put this together. It's a, it's a great idea. I hadn't heard about it before, so I want to start participating in this, come to it, and listen to the different lectures they've had. Um, this is not a happy topic. I mean, if you don't go away from here feeling disgusted and sad and miserable, then I've failed. Um, but that should be really good for the bar because sour, people that are really sad like to drink a lot, so help them out a little bit. Um, before I get into the meat of this, I want to talk about all the people that make this go. Not only do we have our board, but we have a tremendous amount of volunteers every year that help us. Anthony up there in the corner, Will Frost is here, Bill Hagmeyer, different people around here have spent a lot of time every summer helping us with different projects, and without it, we, we couldn't uh, get our work done. I'm not going to talk a lot about Golf Last Keeper because I'm short on time. I thought this was supposed to be a 45 minute talk and actually uh, found out it's only supposed to be 30 minutes so I have enough slides for about two hours here so I'm, I'm going to get at it. Whoops. Is that the way you advance it with the dial on the side or is there a click on it? There's a left click there too. Okay, all right. Uh, First, I want, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of people that help us out, but Antonia is the one we know as our super volunteer. She's been with us from day one when we started this way back in 2001, and she comes out and been working with us every year. She goes out on the volunteer cleanups, as do a lot of people year after year after year, but Antonia also works with us quite a bit, and for some reason, hmm. She likes to take on all the hard jobs. You often find her uh, crawling through the brush, picking up styrofoam. That's a really miserable job in the shin tangle there. And then we have guys like John Combs and Ross Blaker who donate their boats every year and haul uh, volunteers out and they help us with our monitoring projects and our volunteer cleanups and they're always out there working hard. And of course, we've had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers over the years without question and, and uh, they come back every year. They just seem to love it. And then my three boys, they've, uh, without them I couldn't have done this because they go out and work, run the boats for me. In the summertime I'm too busy to do anything other than just uh, logistics and things like that. So my, my kids kind of take control of things out in the field for me. Ryan is my youngest and, and uh, laser pointer. He always seems to find those things. He's the guy that found the Vico suit too. <laughs> and then uh, Eric is my oldest son and he's, uh, he does a lot and unfortunately my two older boys now are moving into their professional careers and they come back and help a little bit as much as they can but it's getting less and less each summer but it's unfortunate because things have gotten much worse. Um, we have several different projects. Am I in your way over there? Um, we do volunteer cleanups. Oh, by the way, I want to clarify something. It wasn't, uh, what was that, a, a million tons? No, no, it's a million pounds. So now your, now your quiz is all messed up. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we do volunteer cleanups and professional cleanups and we do surveys and we do monitoring projects. And this is kind of a laundry list of all the stuff we've done in the last 12 years. So what is marine debris? It's any persistent man-made or modified uh, solid material put in the water. That's NOAA's definition. As far as I'm concerned, it should include chemicals too. After all, most of them are that we throw in the water are man-made, uh, but they don't include that. So pretty much anything from boats to uh, pieces of wood that people have modified or considered marine debris. We focus primarily on plastic and hazardous debris, or the chemicals and containers of debris. So this goes to that, there's another question that was messed up. <laughs> 6.4 million tons to 7 billion tons. Um, I just wanted to show you this, that. This is from United Nations Environmental Program, and 
the estimate of how much debris is put in the ocean every year is, is, is just a guess. And that's a huge uh, range there. So nobody really knows for sure, but it's a lot. This is our operational area. We keep our boats in Whittier and we work all Prince William Sound all the way down here to the Barren Islands. It's quite a range. This is about, oh, 250 miles down here, 275 to the Barren. So we get pretty spread out. Um, our, this is just kind of go through some of our marine, marine debris projects here. Uh, we do our annual cleanup projects that uh, we had to do surveys every year. Every year we do some surveys. We've surveyed over 1,200 miles of beaches now. Then we have our volunteer cleanup every year. We take up to about 100 volunteers out for three days and we'll target a specific area with those volunteers. There might be up to a dozen boats with us. And that, that's a lot of fun. And we do our professional cleanup. We have a crew that works pretty much all summer long out there doing projects. We do projects for NOAA, DEC. Forest Service um, and uh, EVOS is, uh, we do big projects for them now, Evo, uh, Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. And then we do monitoring where we clean a certain number of beaches repeatedly every year and, and collect data off of them. And then now we're moving into uh, plastic to toxicity research. Uh, the surveys, I'm, I'm going to go over this really quick just to uh, speed things up. So we do our surveys and we, you know there's a lot of benefits for doing surveys. The primary one is our funders want to know what's there before they give us a bunch of money to go clean it up. They don't want us to go out there beachcombing. So this is just an example of what we did here a couple summers ago. This is our volunteer cleanup and these are areas, uh, we, we targeted all these areas of the volunteers but some of it the volunteers couldn't get to because it was too rough, too surfy, they couldn't get on those beaches and then our professional crew went back and got them later. This is volunteers cleaning up on Night Island. This beach had been cleaned repeatedly. This is just a picture of our volunteers loading up one of the landing craft loads. They brought in 15 of those loads last summer. Monitoring is a big deal with us. We started uh, cleaning up. We, we had NOAA help us set up sites all around Prince William Sound out on the Gulf Coast to get a good spatial uh, um, data set and uh, so we have 14 sites in Prince William Sound and three out by Gore Point on the Gulf and every year we track what goes on on those beaches. We're tracking 140 categories of debris. We separate all the debris on the beach out in those categories, count each thing in those categories, weigh it all, write down all the data, collect all the debris and take it out of there and we do it over again the next year. So when that tsunami debris hit we had a very very good idea of what was going on. Uh, that's where our sites are situated in Prince William Sound. So when we make that loop all the way around here, you know, that takes us eight days with about eight people to do all that cleanup there. So, and it's about 250 mile trip. That's just, uh, we use the same people. We try to use exactly the same people every year on our, our monitoring so our data collection is consistent. And that's just a group of them. Bill Heiberger back there and Anthony have both helped a lot on that. Uh, the marine debris is uh, monitoring has some challenges. First place, you know, you, you have to identify the material, and then you have to figure out what it's made of. Then you're dealing with little tiny pieces that, that you just don't have the time to, to pick up or to weigh. Then you have these huge bundles of not lines and nets that are impossible to do anything. You can't actually weigh them because they're way too big. Um, then there's always the trouble of trying to get these uh, monitoring project done on a consistent basis so they're pretty much the same month every summer and then you got to deal with storms of course and so there's some variability about when we can hit those beaches and then you deal with stuff like that trying to get the trash off the beach now this goes up to the question or goes to the question of um, what is that <laughs> you know that's a can of styrofoam urethane spray is what it is and so when it ruptured on a beach I think it's beautiful we should have kept it you know <laughs> looks like Picasso went mad out there or something but you know is that hazardous material is that plastic or is that metal so how do you how do you figure that out so it's pretty tough to get a really tight uh, data set on this monitoring and then you have situations like this this pile of there's packing ban in here there's crab line there's trawl line there's nets in there and, and you know, it would take you hours to sort all that out, so it's a pretty tough project. Plus then you got to identify all this stuff and it takes a lot of time. 
And some of this stuff is just too big to weigh. I mean, that thing probably weighed a couple tons. So why do we bother? Well, this is why we bother. Plastic is deadly, and, and it's not just the commercial fishing debris, but it's just the plastic particles, and it's killing a hell of a lot of seabirds, for one thing. Um, this is out on uh, Midway Island, I believe, and that's just another picture over on Kerry Island, I think, but they love, the adults pick up a lot of these cigarette lighters. This is an oyster culture steak, and then they feed it to their chicks and it kills them, and, and there's a lot of seabirds are in serious trouble because of this stuff. And then there's the, the question of submerged nets. These are pictures of the birds taken out of a derelict net that was submerged underwater in, uh, in uh, Puget Sound, and, and it's just amazing how many uh, bird carcasses they drug out of Puget Sound tangled up in nets. So the fish get down in these nets because the nets are still spread out and fishing, and then, then the birds go down to get the the fish and then they get tangled up in it. So uh, submerged nets are killing a lot of birds around the world and NOAA now is starting to become very aware of that so they're pushing hard on that issue. But these are just pictures of what plastic debris does. Of course we're all aware of all the entanglement issues. I think most of us are. California sea line. This is here in Alaska. I mean that's a packing band probably around that but that they're dead. I mean, that sea lion's going to die. There's no question about it. First seal, Pribilofs. Mike Williams, a friend of mine, took that picture. Uh, and that, 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 he's dead. Or she's dead. Um, Tim Veenstra from ATI, Airborne Technology uh, Inc., took this last summer flying uh, the tsunami debris survey for DEC. And if you look closely here, you can see this gill net. This is a local gill net went through the mouth of this whale, see it in through here in the back of its throat? And humpback whale killed it. So it kills a lot of animals, marine debris does. And now we're finding along a lot of beaches we'll find chewed plastic. So anything from tiny little bowls all the way up to brown bears and coyotes and everything in between eat this stuff. So who knows what it's doing to them. This is a scat that we found out on the beaches, various places. Um, black bear, coyote. River otter, these all have that red stuff is plastic. This is gold stuff is plastic. These are not bones in the coyote scat, that's plastic. So, the cleanup methodology it's just basically grunt work. Our beaches are so inaccessible that we can't get heavy equipment on them, nor would we want to because of environmental uh, issues. And I just showed that picture because I went by there and I saw one float under that log, so I started digging at it. Pretty soon, I realized there was a whole turtle's nest full of floats under that log. and I think we wound up pulling 12 of them out from under there and it took a lot of work, but that's just the way it goes. This is looking at the ceiling of a cave, a sea cave. And the storms have pounded that stuff in there and the way we got some of it out of there, we got a big long pole about 20 feet long and taped a knife on the end of it, reaching in there and started popping some of those, uh, these, these uh, plastic floats here. And, uh, we didn't do that too long, though, because soon we started doing that, then the whole cave started to collapse. But there's a whole series of caves out there along the Gore Point region that are full of debris like that, and they're kind of holding up the mountain. Uh, Yokohama floats, those are big ship fender floats, or to hang off the side of the big boats. Those things are extremely heavy, anywhere from about 600 up to a ton or bigger, you know, depending on how big they are, but they're a tremendous amount of work to get out. We cut them up with... Uh, believe it or not, just with serrated knives. Just a typical loads of debris coming out of the northern Gulf Coast. This is out of Chugach Bay, I think, out by Gore Point. But it, it's just astounding how much trash is on those outer Gulf beaches. Another load of debris coming out of Naked Island a couple summers ago. This was a Forest Service project. And so we bring it into town. We put this, uh, this landing craft on a big trailer and pull it up beside that dumpster. That's a 40 yard, 40 cubic yard construction dumpster. And that boat will fill that completely full and probably be about five yards, cubic yards extra that a lot of it is buckets and, and maybe good fenders and buoys and things like that that we set out for other people to take. So we had 40 to 45 cubic yards every time we bring that boat in. Yeah, that's one of the oddball things we found out on the beach on Lone Island, a, a three-wheeler that floated in. That was in that same load. 
But so that's what we wind up where we get a full di full dumpster. Then we run that into town and it goes to the recycling center, uh, Alaska, uh, Cent Alaska Cent Central Alaska Recycling is their name. And then they sort through it for whatever is usable and then they ship it off to, to the Anchorage landfill. And then when we get beaches that are too hard to get landing craft against or we have a tremendous amount of debris we, or, or something really heavy, we'll get helicopters to move it for us. I mean, this, this doesn't look bad here, but <laughs> you can't get a boat in there because it's too shallow and there's way too much surf all the time and nobody wants to get close to it with a boat. So this is one, one load we did with that helicopter. That boat's 100 foot long, so we got a heck of a pile of trash on that thing. This is kind of a before and after picture. This is very typical out there on the Gulf. You'll find debris, you know, sometimes hundreds of yards from the coastline, and, and uh, it's just tedious work to pick it all up. But, you know, there's a lot of areas that have salmon spawning habitat, and uh, if you don't clean it up, then all that stuff's in there uh, impacting the juvenile fish. Where does it come from? Well, this is a dump out in western Alaska. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, Marine debris is consumer and it's come from land-based sources. And that's going to be a problem with global warming and sea level rise. All that stuff's going to be in the ocean and I suppose Russia will have to clean it up because it's going to go that way. There's a tremendous amount of commercial fishing debris. This is brand new bundle that washed up and I don't know if you can see this, but this thing goes under the beach and is way back there. That's a helicopter there for perspective but and that's a person but you know this this bundle of line and nets and whatever all it is, it probably weighs 10 tons or something. It's an amazing amount of, but that's typical. I mean, it's common, not typical, but common on the outer coast. Container spills. This, this to me is a major problem. I just read today that they've cut down the container loss from 100,000 containers per year. They're claiming they're only losing 2,000 containers per year in the ocean now. I think it's probably higher than that because there's no requirement for them to report it. And last January, but a little over a year ago, 29 of them got dumped in the northern Gulf Coast by Costco, Yokohama, and the debris that, or the plastic that was in all those containers is spread all over our coastline now. And nobody's doing anything about it. But that's all consumer goods. These are just examples of what comes with a container spill. Pesticide bottles that were all up and down the coast a couple of years ago. These are all over the place now because of that Costco Yokohama spill. That, there's a container full of these in that Costco Yokohama spill. They're all over the beaches. You can buy those down at the drugstore. Um, these all came out of that spill. They're all, they're, every beach we've gone on last summer, and we were on hundreds of miles of beaches, had those on it. These thousands of these foam balls everywhere. We picked a thousand of them alone off of a Gore Point beach. And so, Um, so that's, you know, those are the three primary sources, land-based consumer stuff and then container spills and uh, commercial fishing and everything in between too, of course, but this is pretty interesting. Uh, how do I, how do I move a cursor on this thing? What's that? The round button in the center is a joystick mouse. I want to turn this on so it runs. You know? now, if you can take that cursor down the left corner, there's an arrow you can hit on it. Yeah, see it down there? Now click up on the screen once. Yeah, it's loading. This is uh, from uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, and they, this is the sea currents surface currents measured by sea level height and temperatures. And I wanted to show you this because you see all this mixing that's going on here, Japan, the Philippines, this is Hawaii out here, this is where that famous garbage patch is. But you can see there's a lot of mixing and you see this current going up here pretty strongly and then it wanders out here like this. And then with storms and everything it winds up going up into the Gulf of Alaska. So you can, okay, we'll go on to the next one here. <coughs> so this is the this is what we, a lot of us up here refer to as the Pineapple Express. That big storm that's set, or low pressure system that sets up in the wintertime here in the Gulf of Alaska. I think October we had three storms that hit 100 miles an hour here in Anchorage coming out of the Gulf. That's what this is right here. So 
it's running across that garbage patch here. It's driving all that debris out of the garbage patch. And once it gets up here in the convergence zone and then in the Alaska coastal current, this is where it's going. I keep going the wrong way, sorry. So this is, can you do the same thing on this one? A couple of ways. So I just want to show you. So once this is what happens, it comes up here and gets blown up here. And then this Alaska coastal current, see it going here? It just pounds it into these areas. It brings it up the coast and just drives it in here against Montague and the Kenai Peninsula and the Kodiak Island. That's why this area has so much tsunami debris in it. And then we have the winter storms. And I just want to show you, this is data off our monitoring sites down here. So this is the total for all the monitoring sites one year and then the next year. So you can see there's a lot of variability in the total weight. Well, it's directly correlated to these wintertime storms. And so this is uh, 2006 and seven, you know, that winter, six, seven winter. And then uh, if you look at that, the storms are, you know, there's they're some over here in this eastern side of the Gulf, but it's not that bad. And then if you look at the next year, then they really hammer in here, and they're higher intensity storms, and then it shoots way up. And uh, then it gets weak the next year, and it drops back down. Then it's a little more the next year. You see that early in the fall, we had some storms that brought trash up in here. And these don't go up high enough to get into that Alaska coastal current, so the debris gets stuck in here and then wind going back out again. But if they make landfall over in this area, it'll bring a tremendous amount of trash into our area. And we get trash from everywhere. I mean, literally, we have bottles and stuff that have marks on them from every country in the world, it seems like. United Air Emirates, you know, and I'm, it probably got tossed off a boat somewhere, but who knows where it came from. And I just want to show you how fast this stuff builds up. This is Cena Bay. This is the first time we cleaned it. And this is a little short beach. It's a couple hundred yards long. And so you're looking at 40, 50 years of plastic accumulation there. We went back in 2011, and that's how much more we got. So on the outer Gulf, it, appear, Gulf, it appears that the increases, it, the deposition rate is increasing. That's probably about a third of what was there in that previous slide. So it's everything from commercial fishing debris, in which there's a tremendous amount of it. This is local gill net float. A lot of these are uh, high seas drift net floats from illegal high seas fishing. Lots of uh, lines, big towing hawser. Now that could be come out of a big trawl net or that could be from a tug, but you know, that's probably eight, nine, ten inches in diameter. That's an awful big line. And then uh, I just wanted to show you that picture, but that just shows you how the tide just moves this stuff back and forth, back and forth, wraps it around, drops and ties it all up. So you wind up with a pretty difficult job getting to some of that stuff out. There's more pictures and more commercial fishing debris here. Uh, totes, er, er, anything you can imagine comes off a boat, you'll find it out there. Packing bands, I, you know, I never did realize what these were for, but you know, all, you, all these uh, factory processing boats go out there and they use the packing bands to bundle their boxes. And a lot of it winds up in the ocean and or the boat gets washed off the deck or anything. And it's the most deadly of all the entanglement debris because it gets up over the neck of a sea lion or a fur seal or whatever and then it gets trapped by the fur and then when they start growing they're dead. So it's, Australia has now banned packing band material in their commercial fishing. We've always had a styrofoam problem in the northern Gulf. Uh, looking at the shorelines in China and such, it's, I think that's where a lot of this comes from. And it just takes a while to get here. But uh, this cave we picked 32 bags of styrofoam out of and this is long before the, the tsunami hit. And it's a lot, of, a lot of work because the bears get into it and they shred it like this, and then it's a really a difficult job picking it up. So this is a perfect job for Antonia. She seemed to like it. That. <laughs> bottles. Ah, man, it's just amazing how many bottles we find. That's one winter accumulation on one beach. There's Will. Take out the, take the fishing game guy out there with me. But this is just examples of different hydrocarbon products we find out there. Some of it's pretty nasty and it's spilling into the wetlands and it's getting into the salmon rearing streams. Creosote logs, it's just to show you what it does to the forest floor. 
drums full of chemicals. Now with the tsunami, there's a vast increase in that stuff, and I don't think we've all sorted out how we're going to deal with that yet. <coughs> we don't have the typical debris you get down lower 48. We don't get a lot of six-pack rings in one beach. One of our monitoring sites, we do get some way ahead of uh, the Bay of Isles on Night Island, but generally we don't see those. One thing we do see in Prince William Sound is a lot of uh, plastic shotgun shells and wads. And for the life of me, I don't know why they don't make them out of wax paper like they did when we were kids, when I was a kid, which was half a century ago. Cruise ship debris. We don't get a lot of cruise ship debris. You hear a lot about that, but this is pretty much, we're convinced it's legacy debris. A lot of this has crude oil on it from the oil spill, so it was out there a long time ago. And, uh, but we're still picking it up. This is interesting. We find a lot of pharmaceuticals from Russia. And we don't know why that is. And nobody seems to be able to identify what's in those bottles. So, uh, but we have a pile of them. May have been, might be container spills, I don't know. And of course, tremendous amount of floats and buoys. Then a few, probably 10 years, well not 10 years ago, maybe six years ago, we started finding these big bundles of fabric out there. I, you know, some textile con uh, shipment that was lost. Notice the dog. And again, the famous three wheel with a easy rider pose there. And there's a famous Vico suit. So it had a little, that my son is very carefully looking in that case of what's in that, that little, little bag there, you know. I figured that's a good Vico employee. But, uh, I, you know, I mean, if you're going to go to sea in a survival suit, why not be loaded, you know? We find a lot of toys and athletic equipment. And this next picture is disturbing. But, you know, that says a lot to me about marine debris. It's really nasty. We do have, uh, you know, recycling is generally tough. I think in the state of Alaska, we're really the only ones that have access to good recycling because we can run it right into Anchorage and go through a recycling plant here. But most of the other communities, they, they're using it for arts and crafts, what they can, and the rest of it's getting landfilled. And it's a problem now because a lot of the small communities are not allowing uh, people to bring in marine debris to put in their landfills. So they don't want them to get filled up. But see, if you're out in the field picking up trash too long, you start looking like trash. <laughs> Some of the artsy stuff that people like to use. I mean, these old cedar floats are even more rare than the Japanese floats. But they sure are beautiful, though, aren't they? These are the famous uh, ducks from the first year toys that a lot of people track all over the place, ducks and turtles. We've had some criticisms over the years about taking money to do this work because people think we're just out there beachcombing, but I tell you what, we're not just beachcombing. This is, this is very difficult work and it's, it's physically very hard and there's a, a fairly high degree of danger involved in this with it because we're working on those outer gulf beaches. There are a lot of surf and waves and it's, it can be kind of scary. But I just want to see all the nets wound up in there. <laughs> it's a really tough job getting all that out of there. This beach about a mile and a half long. Of course, all the debris was on the far end where we couldn't get our boats to, so they had to backpack it all out. That's one way of doing it. That guy there is about 6'6", six, six, I guess, a big guy, so he's, he packed out a mile and a half. Pulling a net out of an estuary that had blocked off the mouth of the salmon estuary, and there were dead birds in that, and of course all the salmon smolts and fry and stuff were in there eating the dead birds, and that just attract more, more birds, so it's just kind of a killing machine. Pulling out gill net off the beach, it's just hard work. Digging out net mining, Chugach Bay. And then you're working on that kind of stuff day after day after day. There's, outside of Montague Island, there's 70 miles of that stuff, and it has more trash in it than you can believe. Just typical slogging through at work here. Cutting up Yokohamas, you know, it, you get four people on and you can cut them up pretty fast. And we've tried power saws and, and uh, reciprocating saws and all kind of stuff. We figured out that a good serrated knife works as well as anything. Loading nets. This is just, just pictures of all the work the guy's doing. Down in the hold, we got a, the one landing craft has a pretty good size hole in it, so that's a guy down below stuffing all the garbage up in the spots or a can. One of the typical loads we bring in. That's a small work boat, Ted Rayner's boat. He, one summer he filled that up 18 times like that, brought it back into Whittier. 
This just happens to be a picture of the boat that's severely overloaded. We had, <laughs> we blew a head gasket or something, so the engine was out, so they just piled it on, just used it for a garbage cow and towed it back all the way from Montague Island. And then there's always the issue of bears, particularly in the spring when we're out there and volunteers were out with volunteers, we're always nervous about bears because the sows will be out on the beaches with their cubs eating grass, so you got to be careful about that. And then, then when you get out to Montague, Henshinbrook, and some of the other areas like the Lost Coast, then you're dealing with brown bears, which is even more frightening in some ways, and they get pretty big. And then there's the surf issues and the storm issues. This is Gore Point while we were working out there. That is not nice. This is a storm where the winds hit over 100, 100 knots and they were trapped for like 12 days. This is way up in a protected bay and that inflatable was flying at times with an outboard on it. Again here they're trying to put extra anchors in because the boats are, that boat has 400 feet of chain and a great big anchor but the, the wind was pushing all over and you can see that the wind is just stripping the water off of that thing. It's really a pretty nasty storm. And yet, and one thing, people see all of our pictures and they always look so nice and sunny and beautiful, but most of the time, or a good percentage of the time, at least half of the time, it's raining and miserable out there and people don't take their cameras out on days like that. So I just want to sh <laughs> show you that this is what it's like a lot of the time. And it's, it's and here they're digging out a pom-pom or an oil mop from the Exxon Valdez oil spill that was bedding in the beach, and that's full of oil. And <laughs> when we first cleaned Prince William Sound, probably 2% of what we took out of Prince William Sound was related to the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and Exxon gave us exactly zero dollars to help clean that mess up. So they go out and they work their tails off, and after a month or so, they look pretty good when they first start out, right? This is what they wind up looking like. <laughs> Doesn't take long either. So this is two projects we did down here on the very end of the Kenai Peninsula, uh, that, that are of particular note. Gore Point, when we first hit it in 2007, this beach right here is only about a third of a mile long, and it had uh, 25 tons of plastic on it. That's a tremendous amount of plastic. That's that big barge load that I showed you earlier. And so the guy spent 20 days on this forest floor cleaning it up. And there was trash 300 yards back into the forest. That's, that's the East Beach, and it faces the Gulf, or the East, and it hits the last coastal current, and all the prevailing weather hits on that beach. And this is really a neat place because there are a whole bunch of native pit sites in here. It's a really uh, an important <coughs> historical site, and it's also Catchmack Bay State Wilderness Park, so it's, it's really a beautiful place. And this is on the West Beach where some idiot drove his boat up there and left it for us to deal with. And this is the North Beach. And you can see all these little white spots or bags of garbage they have stacked around as far as you can see, you know. There, I think there were a couple thousand bags on that beach. or no, Not a couple thousand, maybe a thousand, but a lot. So uh, that's a picture of that East Beach log jam that they spent a couple weeks cleaning too the first time. And you can still, this picture you can see there's still quite a bit of debris in there. And that's just the perspective of those guys, what they look like when they're down in there cleaning. It's a pretty, it's a pretty daunting task. That's a picture in the forest floor, cleaning in there. And that's what it looks like after they cleaned it. And you can see a lot of, the, lot of that area has no vegetation because the plastic has smothered it all out. But you look closely, see all the styrofoam still in there, it's, it's just impossible to get it out. And that's when they pile all the stuff up in the forest and then, they, then we transferred it into big super sacks. And then we got the helicopter came in there and just pull it right straight up out of the trees, which really, I didn't think they could do it, but it, it works slick. And that's just one of the helicopters slinging those super sacks out. Another picture of that loaded landing craft. So that's like 12 feet high and 20 feet wide, so that's a pretty big pile. I think we had 40 tons on that when we got it back to port. So this is a picture of the guys after the beach was cleaned, and they were really happy, because I see somebody's doing a cartwheel there. <laughs> So we went back to Gore Point last summer because that East Beach is now one of our monitoring sites. This is what happened last winter. This is all tsunami debris. And you look at this tremendous amount of garbage in here. And we picked up 3,300 pounds in fresh garbage on that beach this summer and past last summer. And over 900 pounds of that was styrofoam. 
And 900 pounds of styrofoam is a huge amount of styrofoam. Piles and piles of it. And this just to show you how difficult it is that this is Gore Point, that same trip, and just to show you how hard it is to get in and off some of these beaches. Now, I mean, that doesn't look bad, right? And that's a rigid hull inflatable with an outboard on it, which is spinning wildly, and you know, now, <coughs> but it's just tough work, and it, there's, you just can't seem to avoid it at times. I call that uh, my Gore Point crane dance. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth Lake is quite a challenge. It's a little lake way down on the very southwest end of the Kenai Peninsula. There's a little island just a couple miles offshore called Elizabeth Island. And there's the lake right there. Again, this is east. This is where prevailing weather comes. It's where Alaska coastal current comes this way. So all that debris I showed you earlier is coming around this way. So the storms drive it over that beach and into that lake. That lake's about at most a fifth of a mile in diameter. That's another aerial picture of it. This is all floating log jam. That's big logs have been tossed up over this big beach here. and, and uh, so it's really so it's all full of debris, or it was. That's just another picture of that area. So that's the berm going up in the lake, so you can just pounded plum full of trash. Then you get up to that floating log jam on the back side, and that's what it looks like. And over three summers we took 17 tons of plastic out of that tiny little lake, and it was in off the all around the sides of it now, and, and we actually cleaned the bottom of it too. This is 800 yards. From the, from the ocean back here, and they're trashed that far back in the, above the lake. But this has got really great silver salmon spawning habitat. So uh, we took all the nets and everything out of that log jam and opened up that spawning habitat, and now we're doing studies on the, the juvenile salmon out there to see what the plastic's done to them, and it's not a pretty sight. That's just the guys working in that lake. Very, very difficult, because all these logs are floating and treacherous, very treacherous working on that stuff. This is show how hard it is to get one of these gill nets out of this thing and you know they packed a inflatable up there and towed it across, towed it out, loaded in inflatable, take the inflatable across the lake, unload it, drag everything down to the shoreline. This is all from Elizabeth Island, this is all from the lake, all this stuff. That's the next year we went back and we took a long gaff and we gigged all the bottom and pulled all the nets out of the bottom of the lake. <coughs> so now we move on to the issue of, of the toxicity. Everybody looks at this stuff and you just see it and it's obvious, but there's a lot more of it that you don't see. Only about half of plastic floats, half of it sinks. So there's a huge amount of plastic in the bottom of the ocean. Um, of course, it all has its inherent chemicals and when it breaks down, there. Plastic just breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller particles to the point where a small organism can pick it up. And then whatever those compounds are in the plastic, then they're in the food chain and up they go. So um, I, I love this picture. It's a very interesting idea that, you know, there's a hell of a lot more to this than you don't see. Again, now we're getting into the nurdles. These little beads are nurdles. Elizabeth Island Lake is full of nurdles. There's not a nurdle manufacturer within thousands of miles of that lake. And we haven't really looked at other places, but my understanding is you can pick up, get nearly any beach anywhere in the world, and you can take a bunch of sand and throw it in a bucket or a tub and swish it around, and nurdles will float out. So we have polluted the whole entire uh, world with this stuff. This is plastic feedstock for making extruded plastic items or even styrofoam or whatever. Tremendous amount of chemicals coming in, as I said early, Earlier, Elizabeth Island Lake had an amazing amount of chemical containers all around it, and the lake was full of this really bad sheen on top of it. I mean, it, it was like a thick scum, actually. It's clean now. We haven't seen that sheen on it since we cleaned it that first year, so we did make some progress. But there's still a tremendous amount of chemicals in that lake. So we partnered with the College of William and Mary in Virginia and the uh, University of Anchorage, Alaska, to look at uh, chemicals that are leaching out of the plastic. So they settled on looking at phthalates, which are a plasticizer used in all kinds of plastic, makes it flexible and bendable. And phthalates have a lot of problems with them. And uh, you, know, if you can read that, I'm not gonna read it to you. So it's not, it's not something we want in our food chain. 
And so what we did was we <laughs> trapped uh, juvenile coho salmon out there and took out their immune tissues. And then they took it back and drew those in cultures at William and Mary. And then Dr. Kennish at UAA analyzed it for six different phthalates. And uh, that's just <laughs> some of the fish we were sampling there. So uh, we had some really great control studies. This is, these are both from Elizabeth Island. This is out of the lake proper. This is out of the stream above the lake where there wasn't any plastic. And you can see this DEHP, which is a phthalate, is extremely high in the juveniles in the lake, juvenile salmon. And that's what happens when you add DHP to cultured immune cells. There's a dose-dependent response and it kills them, and it kills them quite quickly, and it doesn't take that high of a dose. Now, I'm not the scientist doing this, so not, that's about as best I can do for the explanation. So uh, they're quite concerned about it. It's an ongoing study. It's going to probably be published next year, but it's probably going to stir up the, the commercial fishing industry up here when they start realizing what kind of a mess they have on their hands. So last summer we did three different, well, we did quite a few different projects. We did this project down here for Marine Conservation Alliance Foundation. In the red, we did for an Exxon Valdez Oilsville Trustee Council. This is where we did our volunteer cleanup. This project we did for DEC late last fall, uh, end of September and early October. So that was what we wound up doing over the course of the summer. And, and we pulled in a tremendous amount of trash. But early in the spring, I went out here and there was tsunami debris all over this. And as the season progressed, the tsunami debris started coming into the sound. And by last fall, it was all up and down the side of Night Island here and scattered out all through a lot of this area. Most, a lot of styrofoam. That's just McLeod Harbor cleanup we did early. That's just a pile we got out of that bay. This, there were, uh, this is the biggest pile, but there were at least five other big piles of debris out of that one bay. This shows you a, a big net they were trying to extract out of the beach out at McLeod Harbor and how difficult it was. The whole crew worked on that for a day and a half. Huge net and a really difficult place to get to. You can see how bad the, the reefy stuff is there. So it, they couldn't really haul it back out to the inflatables to get it off that beach. And so when they get done, they figured over half of that was still in the beach. And you can see it's sticking out of the beach way down here. So we're hoping that storms will pull out the rest of that and we can get it later. And that was way out on this point out here, around the corner. So we used a helicopter to pull that net out of there. That net weighed 4,200 pounds, the part we got out of there. This just shows you what they projected for the track of the tsunami debris early on. And you can see a lot of it, they figured it'd go down here further south and then circle back. But the truth of the matter is, they're now thinking 75% of it's coming right here. They didn't, they didn't add in windage. So this is, so you had all of this, what, they had like 5 million tons they figured went into the ocean from the tsunami and 1.5 million was still floating as of last summer. So if you get 1% of that, we're talking 30 million pounds just to reach Alaska, just 1%. And odds are we're going to have vastly more than that that are going to hit our shorelines. But last summer, DEC commissioned a survey for uh, Airborne Technology Inc. did that. And they flew all this coastline. And everywhere they looked, they found tsunami debris, and a lot of it. Um, this is where the tsunami debris is in Prince William Sound now. We know it's there. We've seen it. Uh, it's worst out here along the outside of Montague Island. There's an incredible amount of tsunami debris out there. This goes to that styrofoam question. Some beaches had 100-fold increases in styrofoam over the six-year average. But the coast-wide average from our monitoring sites is at least seven times, 700% increase in the amount of tsunami on an annual basis, or uh, amount of styrofoam on an annual basis. And that's just a different way of looking at it. The way it went up, whoops, sorry. And uh, you know, the, the buckets went up, everything went up. That, the lightweight, wind-driven stuff went up considerably. And just to, we also looked at lines and nets that the wind went influence, and they stayed pretty consistent. So. We know that this stuff was uh, wind-driven tsunami debris. And this is just some pictures of all the styrofoam that we ran across last summer. Huge blocks of it, busted docks, things like that, buildings. Massive. That thing weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. It was saturated with water. That's about three feet thick and six feet wide and nine feet long. It's a massive piece of styrofoam. This is, these guys picked this up in about 15 minutes. This is all Japanese stuff, every bit of it. Japanese fuel cans, big aquaculture flows from oyster farms. These big bundles 
I saw them all over and when I was in Japan and went and visited some of that area here about a month ago and they bundled their floats like that on the shoreline, they're all tied together. <coughs> this is a picture I took on Montague in January, stuff still coming up, fresh Japanese tsunami debris. Birds are eating it, this is a core of a refrigerator, this urethane foam insulation and you can see the animals are eating it. This is out of a crushed building. You can see that wire webbing going through there to give it structural strength that makes it very difficult to recycle or dispose of this stuff. That's urethane foam. This is just a picture on the outside of Montague and that's what it looks like for 70 miles. Tremendous amount of garbage in there and all this yellow stuff is all urethane foam from crushed buildings. And that's what it looked like. I took this picture probably right around the 1st of October October out there on the outside of Montague, and that's what's happening to the styrofoam. This is off the DEC cleanup we did there, there at the end of September. This is a beach we cleaned just the previous summer. We know it was completely clean, and that's what the tsunamis are doing to it. Same thing here, same, same beach, or another beach in that same area we cleaned the year before, and now it's just covered with styrofoam. And that's what happens to styrofoam if you don't clean it up. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it becomes styrofoam soil out there and not good for the wildlife. Is it Japanese? <laughs> I would think so. I, I, we had a lot of Japanese reporters out there with us this summer and they all said, yeah, this is Japanese. There's no question about it. That styrofoam and urethane freight on it, same thing. And it's not all lightweight stuff. This is a <laughs> huge reel of high pressure plastic gas line inch and quarter diameter and there's 4,000 feet on that thing it says so right on it so I don't know how we're ever going to get that out you can see the storms picked it up threw it over this reef back in this little gully so I don't know what we're going to do with it and then there's always the slob hunters they have set up hunting camps and then over the years leave their fuel behind and so we had to clean up for the forest service last summer that's another source of debris and not everything comes by sea, some of it falls out of the air. We've found probably six airplanes on Montague Island now on the beach. So it's, you know, it's not, you know, I've said there's three main categories of debris, but there's always oddball things to find. That's it. Wow. Question. Sorry, it's sad enough to start drinking now? <laughs> so, uh, I got the first question. Are you going to get any of the money that's come from the Japan? Uh, I think they, what, they sent $6 million over, and then uh, I thought the federal government was going to appropriate some money for the cleanup. Is any of that money going to go to you? Well, can you please repeat people's questions so we can all know what the question is? He pointed out that the Japanese had donated money for tsunami to clean up and ask if Gulf Last Keeper is going to get any of that. I, uh, Elaine back here from DEC would be the best one to answer that. But So the money is not all coming to Alaska. You know, it got split up in between the five impacted states and two trust territories. And I believe that uh, DEC is getting $250,000 and they're going to send out requests for proposals. So we'll have to enter that. So... For that money and then uh, then there'll be some more coming later so you know we, we just have to get in that uh, submit a proposal see if we get accepted just like everybody. Uh, I helped clean up two years ago you show up to that you talked about that. <clears throat> but I was going to talk about that so I've lived most of my life around fishing. Uh, I'm, I can't hear you. <clears throat> I was wondering about the nets and I've lived most of my life in fact I lived in Alaska for 14 years so I've seen unbelievable and I was raised in Sitka so I've seen a lot of fish to breathe. Right. <clears throat> the poly nets really burn good, but they burn smoky. Have you ever thought about a trade-off to the environment, the, uh, trying to burn them versus the, uh, the environmental and the smoke? You know, all you're doing is shipping your pollution downstream when you right. do that, and a lot of people have asked that question. A lot of people looked into it, and they talked about it. He wanted to know if we to, it'd be better to burn the nets than haul them home. I'm sorry. And so... Um, <laughs> We've all thought about it. We've all thought about incinerators and everything, and it, it's a tough regulatory and technological hurdle to uh, overcome, basically, so. Yeah, is there a chance that um, 
any state or federal legislators could have shown this program to see if, in fact, there could be more than the five or six million dollars squeezed out of Japan for cleaning up the mess that they've certainly created. We've uh, coming from Japan, did you say? Well, I'm going to ask him. Yeah. Yeah, or from from any of the international sources, but specifically since the amount of debris from the tsunami is coming from that area, is there a chance to have the federal or certainly state or federal legislators put more pressure on the on the governments of the other countries to see if we can get more of their money to help clean up their mess here? You're right. I, under, I understand that question. Right from, so he wants to know if we, we can get our legislature, the federal government, to put more pressure on a responsible party here, as you want to call that, to get more money out of them to help with this cleanup. And, and we, uh, you know, right at the start, people were saying, well, Japan, this is Japan's fault. Japan should clean this up. Well, we had Superstorm Sandy that put a huge amount of rain debris in the Atlantic Ocean that's going to go to Europe. And somebody's got to clean that up. And so, and like I said, I was over in Japan just recently visiting all these areas, and they're absolutely devastating. They're trying to rebuild, and they're broke. They're broke just like our federal government is. So who has money? Alaska. <laughs> it's the only place I know that has any money. And so we approached the legislature for funding ourselves with, in coalition with a couple other cleanup groups in the state. And we just heard today that the House put a million dollars into their budget that would go to us and then we'd split it with other groups. And that's a start. But our estimates, it'll be over $100 million to clean this mess up. $10 million, we figure, just to do Montague Island because you're talking big boats and helicopters and everything else. So it's tremendously expensive. Um, we're hoping that the state money combined with the Japanese money will allow us to pick up a huge pile of trash and document how bad this is and get more press on it. And unfortunately, as hard as Senator Bage and Senator Murkowski are working, they're not having any luck in D.C. How many years do you expect it will take for all the dust and debris from Japan to clear here? How long will it take for all of the tsunami debris to get here? A lot of it's going to get uh, trapped in a North Pacific gyre, what a lot of people call alley gyre. And it's going to go round and round and round, and it'll get spit out on a kind of a regular cycle, depending on the storms and everything. So it could potentially be coming for decades, but we think the, the vast majority of it will be probably six years, something like that. That's kind of what we're thinking. But it, it's a lot of variables there. Right, he says we're talking about tsunami, but isn't the biggest problem people just throwing stuff in the ocean? And I think you're right. And my son and my nephew work for a geology company, and they go around the world on third world boats, basically doing seismic and sonar data work. And they said every third world country boat they're on, third world boat, throws all their debris in the ocean. And that's against the international law, but there's no enforcement. So we have a real problem. There's no question about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, second question, how do you volunteer? What's that? Second part of the question, how do you volunteer? So she wanted to know if there's any plans to use the, the plastic for biomass for power generation and how do you volunteer? There's been a lot of talk about using the plastic for generation, cogeneration, and all those nets that you were talking about earlier, Vernon. They say if they put 10% uh, polyethylene in these nets or polypropylene, whatever they are, chop it up and put it into biomass burners and increases the efficiency like 40%. But people talk about that, but then you have to bring it to a central site. You have to have customer base. And when you look at Alaska with our low population base, and it becomes very, very difficult to pull this off in any kind of economic uh, responsible way. And then how do you volunteer? We have a volunteer cleanup every year. You can go on goak.org and look at that and get my contact information, which is right down there, by the way. You can just chris at goak.org and send me an email. Um, we're getting pretty full for this year. We're limited on how many people we can carry on the boat, so that's a problem. We're, we're kind of maxed out right now, but we may have some slots left over. You guys are working with a lot of 
dangerous chemicals. And I was wondering, how do you protect your volunteers when they're out there? But also, how do you, what, what happens to the, the oil byproducts? What happens to those chemicals? How do you dispose of them? Um, um, so how do we protect the volunteers from hazardous material? And what do we do with the hazardous material when we find it? Well, we don't care about the volunteers. <laughs> no, that's not true at all. <laughs> Um, it, it's a really difficult issue for us. We just last year when we realized what's happened, we had our, our crew hazmat certified. They took the 40-hour hazwalker class, which basically allows them to kind of basically identify stuff and say, stay away from it or whatever. And then we're going to have to call in the experts. And our volunteers, uh, it, it's really tough to have somebody with every volunteer. And a lot of the volunteers work in their own groups, but they've been at it long enough now. And, and we just tell them, you know, you find chemicals, Leave them alone, let us know, and we'll deal with them. And it, it's, it's a real issue. I think it's going to be our hardest issue to deal with because once we find it, there's questions of moving it up on the uplands to get it out of the surf zones, and then upland owners don't want it there because then they may get responsible for it. And there's all kinds of issues we're trying to iron out with the state and the feds and how we're going to deal with that. Yeah, is any of that stuff yeah, is any of this stuff radioactive? There's a lot of interest in that from the Fu Fukushima radioactive or reactor damage. Right away, I looked into, I did a bunch of research on that, and I concluded that there wasn't going to be much of an issue for us because of uh, uh, half lives and because of water dilution and everything. But as we look at it more, one of the people that works with us was a radiation safety officer for the university she, where she's a professor and. She said that she didn't think the reactor was the big problem. She thinks that all the research facilities, like, and university research f facilities, hospitals, you know, any kind of labs that had low-level radiation for doing different research or, you know, for medical stuff, that stuff is quite typically just stored in even, like, plastic drums because a lot of it's shortwave radiation, and they don't have to worry about it, and they just store it and let it sit for 20 years, and then they throw it away. And so the question is, where did all of that stuff go? And where is it? And you can't pick it up on a, uh, a Geiger counter because of shortwave radiation, so you have to use a skinnilator, and nobody's using a skinnilator. So that may be an issue for us. And that, you know, we're still trying to track that one down. But generally, I don't think it's going to be a big issue. Who does your helicopter support? How does that get paid for? Well, it comes out of our grants. And we've used uh, Maritime Helicopter down at Homer. They're absolutely terrific. We use uh, Alpine Air out of Girdwood, and they're terrific, too. They're both really, they're just really fun to work with. Plus, it's just fun to fly in helicopters. Is there any effort put into taking the, the plastics out of the ocean before it gets on shore? Is there any effort to take the plastic out of the ocean before it gets on the shore? You hear about these garbage patches, particularly particularly the one that's uh, northwest of, or northeast of Hawaii. And, but when you start looking at the size of these areas, I mean, that thing, you know, it's like an amoeba, expands and contracts and blows all over and changes. And, and you know, it's just sometimes as big as the state of Texas, and there's plastic 2,000 feet deep in the water column. And so people look at this, and, and the cost of trying to get it out in the ocean is just astronomical. I don't, you know, there's some people, there's a group out of Canada that think they're going to do it, but I don't think so. Any more? Uh, is there uh, any plan to open up a dedicated facility to get rid of particular tsunami debris? Um, not that I know of, and for years I've been advocating that when we bring these loads of plastic in, and even in Anchorage, all of our plastic, it should be put into a dedicated place in the landfill for future mining instead of spreading it out all over. Because, you know, there is a potential that someday they could get a plant here to burn plastic, and it'd be nice to have all that handled and use, use the power. But, yeah, we better build a gas line from North Slope, you know, and spend $8 billion <laughs> on that. that. That'll work better. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there was talk about going out on Montague and digging a big pit, putting all the plastic in that, but I, for one, wouldn't want to do that. I just, just 
bothers me to even think of leaving our garbage behind for some future generation to pick it up. So I, I don't think so. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the local landfills like Kodiak and uh, what's the other one? Elaine would know, but they're not taking uh, tsunami debris. They're not taking plastic marine debris anymore. They just don't have the capacity to do that. So this uh, disposal is going to be a real problem going into this summer. I think we're going to have a tough time with that. They're having fun. <laughs> You'll have to ask him individually when he gets off the stage if you have more questions. Thank you very much.